I want to welcome everyone, those of you who are streaming in with us, as well as our fellow board members, uh, to our board meeting tonight. And before we begin, I want to have Ms. Sawyer take roll call. Pam Pereza. Here. Sharon Warden. Here. George Archuleta. Here. Virginia Houston. Present. Daniel Spence. Here. Rodney Walton. Here. And Dr. Sheila Williams. Here. Thank you. We are begin going to begin tonight with our superintendent's report as we normally do. But before we do that, I have a statement that I would like to read as chair. Before we move forward with our actions tonight, we must address the process and purpose of our work. First and foremost, as a board, we must remember that we are a board of governance. We must establish trust and confidence with our primary stakeholders and our community, which consists of our students and their parents, the superintendent that we have entrusted with district leadership and management, and those who touch our students' lives each day. Our work is essential to our entire community's progress and growth. So each of us must have both a voice and an ear of willingness. As chair, I see my role to be a leader that allows for and encourages the democratic process, assuring that transparency and procedural decorum along with informative decision-making prevail. As chair, it is also my responsibility to see that the proper protocol according to parliamentary procedure is followed and to be prepared for any anomaly that may occur. For this reason, I wish to address last Tuesday's committee meeting to assure our listening public and our community members that protocol was followed and I would like to sincerely apologize for what seemed to be a moment of unpreparedness on my part. As a member of this board, I take my obligations to this community very seriously. And to my fellow board members, I take the esteemed honor of being the chairperson even more so. So with that, Dr. Emmons, I turn the meeting over to you for your report. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Warden, Vice Chair Perez, board members, district staff, and community. I'm bringing you my superintendent's report for this evening. The first on my report is Board Appreciation Month. And we would like to say a huge thank you to our Board of Education for your support, your care and concern that you have for the students and staff of Elizabeth City Pasquotank Public Schools. And I would like to share with you that there have been many thank yous sent to the Office of the Superintendent on behalf of staff for the bonus that you all gave them um, at the beginning of this month. And this, I'm going to hold it up, is from P.W. Moore oh, wow. and their staff. Many, and I, I cannot express to you, many staff members from several of our schools. And I think all of the schools have sent a thank you to the board, but they also included a message from the staff to you as the Board of Education for their appreciation for you all taking care of them with the um, teacher, with the staff bonus. It wasn't just a teacher bonus, but the staff bonus. So I wanted to make sure that you all saw this and knew how much um, and how grateful our staff are for the um, support that you provided to them. I'd also like to share with the board um, the Elizabeth City Pasquotank Public Schools is grateful for the partnership with Albemarle Regional Health Services and for their steadfast support during these unprecedented um, times. Um, 
Albemarle Regional Health Services was proactive in prompt in scheduling a COVID vaccination clinic for our staff. We had over 300 staff members that expressed interest in receiving the vaccine. And we also want to express appreciation to the Pasquotank Camden Elizabeth City Emergency Management and all law enforcement who helped manage the logistics for the clinic. And I know that some of you also received the COVID vaccination for the first round, so we cannot thank them enough for their help with that. And as you may recall that due to the health to the pandemic, it has become increasingly difficult for parents to schedule appointments to obtain health assessment for students as required by the state. Michael Bratton, PA, and his wife, Hannah, and Elizabeth City Pasquotank Public Schools nurse graciously partnered and volunteered with ECPPS to hold a clinic assisting parents with this important requirement. The Brattons were also assisted by Lauren Wilson, who is also a school nurse with Elizabeth City Pasquotank Public Schools. Bratton is a um, PA with Easton Cardiovascular Center, and we cannot express how much we appreciate him reaching out to us and offering this service for our students. It was incredibly helpful to our families and to our school district. And you may recall that we had some um, students who were not going to be able to attend school because they had not received a health assessment. So he reached out, volunteered, and provided this for our students and our families. So thank you. So he, yes, a huge thank you for that. <laughs> um, and it was so convenient. And also this month, over the past couple of weeks, We've held special drive through events to honor and recognize employees who have retired from August 2019 to January 2021. Congratulations to all of our retirees and thank you for your service to ECPPS. We value and greatly appreciate your service to children, families, and our community. And congratulations goes to those recognized on January the 13th which were, and I know I'm gonna get in trouble when I start reading all these names. Um, we have Barbara Bell, Charlotte Blunt, Cheryl Bogey, I hope I said that right, Mary Beth Bruns, Elise Combs, Patricia Daniels, Mary Fishman, Tony Floyd, Frankly, Frankie Floyd, Dorothea Grayson, Sharon Green, Wanda Hathaway, Suzanne Jackson, Wayne James, Amy Lamb, Richard Lanau, Joan Metzger, Duncan Moore, Patricia Montone, Deborah Old, Janet Overton, Joanne Ray, Jacqueline Reed, Edward Thornton, Patricia Thornton, Novella Turner, Wren Turner, Wendy Waller, and Lisa Womble. And on our second um, recognition. Congratulations to those recognized on January the 20th, which included Lee Austin, Valerie Capel, Allie Cartwright, Angela Cobb, Francis Collins, Joy Harrell, Jennifer Hawkins, Paulette Irvin, Jenny Jackson, Bernadette Johnson, Daryl Lewis, William Old, Shirley Powell, Willie Thomas, Lamont White, Howard Williams, and Francis Worthington. So congratulations to all of our retirees. And as a part of my superintendent's report, I would like to share our return to campus update for second semester. And each time I share the numbers and where we are in terms of the students who are attending face-to-face -face or still in remote status for our elementary schools. As you can see for our, the first column is the students that are face-to-face. -face, and then we have our total population. New students who are face-to-face -face for second semester. These are students who did not attend face-to-face -face first semester, but are now face-to-face. -face. And we still have some students that are on the waiting list for face-to-face, -face. and we do have some students that have returned to remote learning. And I don't know if you all can read the chart from where you're sitting, so I will go through it pretty quickly. 
For pre-K, we have 67 students that are face-to-face -face out of a student population of 113. We have five new students who are face-to-face -face for second semester. We do not have any students on the waiting list, and we had two students that returned to remote learning. For Central Elementary, we have 147 students that are face-to-face, -face, 301 total population, student population, nine new students that are face-to-face -face for second semester, 29 on the waiting list, and 41 students that return to remote learning. For J.C. Sawyer, 176 students are face-to-face -face out of a student population of 344. Ten of those students are new to, I'm sorry, new for face-to-face -face for second semester. We have 22 on a waiting list and seven students that return to remote learning. Um, for Northside, we have 232 students that are face-to-face -face with a student population of 438. Six students that are new for second semester face-to-face, -face, 43 on a waiting list, and three students that return to remote learning. For Pasquotank Elementary, we have 137 students that are face-to-face -face out of a student population of 267, 14 students that are new for face-to-face, -face, five on the waiting list, and six that have returned to remote status. P.W. Moore, 174 students that are face-to-face, -face, 369 total student population, 10 students that are new to face-to-face, -to -face, 9 that are on the waiting list, and 16 that return to remote status. For Sheep Harney, we have 101 students that are face-to-face, -face, 329 total student population. We have 8 new students that are face-to-face, -face, 36 on the waiting list, and 15 that have returned to remote status. And for weeks for elementary, 131 students that are face-to-face -face, and 212 total student population, five students that are new to face-to-face -to -face, and 12 that are on the waiting list, and five students that return to remote status. And now we'll give you the numbers update for the middle schools. For Elizabeth City Middle School, we have 254 students that are face-to-face -face out of the population of 611. 21 students are new for second semester face-to-face, -face. 19 are on the waiting list, and we had 19 students that returned to remote status. For River Road Middle School, we have 235 students that are face-to-face, -face, 607 for the total student population, 15 students that are new for second semester face-to-face, 20 on the waiting list, and five that went back to remote status. And for our high schools, at the early college, we have 26 students that are face-to-face -face out of the student population of 133, six that are new to face-to-face -face second semester. We do not have any students on the waiting list that want to be face-to-face, -face, and we have three students that return to remote status. For Northeastern High School, 147 students that are face-to-face, -face, 611 total student population. We have 54 new students that are face-to-face -face for second semester, 10 on the waiting list, and 15 that went back to remote status. And for Pasquotank County High School, we have 143 students that are face-to-face -face out of a student population of 670, 40 students that are new to face-to-face -face for second semester, five on the waiting list, and we did not have any students from Pasquotank High School to return to remote status. And we do have, in some instances, where we have students that have not, whose parents have not officially said that they were in remote status, but have missed more than, and I shouldn't say missed more than six days, but have not been on campus more than six days. But they're not counted absent because they're still in remote, um, receiving instruction remotely. And that ends my superintendent's report for this evening. Thank you. I, I have a question about it. Do you have a general idea as to why the students who uh, chose to return to remote, why they did? Do you have a general idea? Yeah. Why? Okay. Yeah, and uh, Ms. James Davis will probably be able to help out with this too. Um, in general, some of it's because the parents have decided because of the spread in the community that they want to keep their students mm -hmm. home. Okay. 
All right. Anyone and then, else so, and sometimes it could be if they if they're still considered face to face and they've missed some days, it could be because they were in quarantine. Mm -hmm. So that would be included in that as well. Okay. Now, I do have a question. I noticed some of the schools still had a high waiting list, mm -hmm. but I saw that they had also had a high number of people who did not return mm -hmm. to face to face. Why is that waiting list still hot? Why do we substitute those people who left? with the people on the waiting list? Because I saw that was like a big discrepancy. No, yeah. Some of them have a big discrepancy. And if you if we go back to some of those slides, you can see where we had that third column where it says students that were new to face-to-face. -to -face. Right, those are students that have come in. So those are new to face-to-face. -to -face, and then you have some that have left face-to-face. -face. So they have filled those slots, but you still have more students on the waiting list that want face-to-face -face than we can accommodate in the schools. If we can go back to that slide real quick, the, the elementary school. There's just a couple that I noticed. I may have overlooked something. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Godfrey will have to go uh, back okay. to okay. you. I think it was, one of them was like 40 people on the waiting list. And you had, man, I, I don't want to. It was North Side. Going. They have 232 students that are already in. Mm -hmm. They have six new students. Right. They had three that went back to remote yeah, staff. That was another one. That was another and, but they had 43 on the waiting list. What's that second one? Central. That's Central. Central. Central Elementary. So Central, we had nine mm -hmm. that were new, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. You had 29 on the waiting list, and you had mm -hmm. 41 who did not show back up for face to face. Right. And it was so that 20. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You're right. So I was looking at that 29 number. Mm -hmm. If we only had nine to come new, and we have 41 who left out, it seemed like that 29 could have went down. Was yeah, and it depends on where that 41 was located. So if the 41 was, say, Vinegard first and second, but that 29 went at fourth and fifth, we may not have had space for the fourth and fifth. But I know they're bringing in students for any open slots that we have. They're bringing students back in, and sometimes it could depend on transportation. Um, so if they have to wait for bus transportation, it takes us at least two weeks to schedule students on a bus route. Because one change on a bus, because you can only fit a certain number, like one per seat on a bus. And so if you make one change or one student who needs bus transportation, we have to figure out how to get that student on. And we're down five bus drivers. Isn't that right, Ms. Um, is that right, Ms. Dane? That was the last report. Mm -hmm. Five, five drivers. Yeah. So, and we didn't, we didn't, when did we find out when the students were not coming back? We didn't find out till we came back? Is that when we found out? Well, some of them, no, some of them, the principals surveyed. And so they've been working on this like in December, trying to figure out who wants to come back and who's not coming back. So I would say between December and now, and some of those um, families have put their names on the waiting list for face to face before December. But um, we can follow up and find out exactly when each principal found out. But I know they were working diligently on it in December. And I can have this broken down for you. Ms. No, I just Davis saw the break it down. No, you're fine. I just saw the number was pretty high versus mm -hmm. what we had space for. So I'm like, why wow, we still had a huge. And it wasn't just that school. It was a couple more schools that mm -hmm. had space. It looks like space. I think it just depends but we on the grade level. The grade, the grade, mm -hmm. Yeah, the grade level. Yeah, grade level is probably the most important. Okay. You don't have the staff to handle. Yeah. And that's another piece that we, we're having to look at is that we're having staff that has to quarantine or are positive. And so as we start getting limited on our number of subs, we have some new subs, but if we should get limited on that, then when that, a teacher is out for quarantine, then the whole class could potentially have to go remote just because we wouldn't have anyone to cover the class. So these numbers are going to fluctuate from month to month. Okay, looking at our next item, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the minutes for December 7th. December 14th, December 21st, January 4th, and January 19th. Could I have a second for that? Second. Okay. 
It has been moved and seconded that we approve these minutes and we take a vote by roll call. Thank you, Ms. Sawyer. Pam Pereffa. Aye. George Archuleta. Aye. Virginia Houston. Aye. Daniel Spence. Aye. Rodney Walton. Aye. Dr. Sheila Williams. Aye. Thank you. It carries. Okay. Next item, public forum. Do we have anyone, Ms. Sawyer? No, ma'am. Okay. So we're going to move on and we're going to take action on several items that were discussed at our committee meeting that were asked to uh, go on review and, and take action tonight. And those are the budget amendments, the school fundraisers, the fall policy updates, and the web page development piece. Are there any questions or discussions about any of those items before we take action on those? Okay, under policy, fall policy update, there is a temporary requirement for employee health certificate, and that will be taken off the consent agenda for today for further review, and it will be done in the next meeting. Okay, so is everybody clear on that? Okay, so we will not be taking action on the temporary requirement for employee health certification. Okay, all right. Could you offer a motion for that, um, Ms. Houston, please? Okay. <clears throat> I move that we place the policy dealing with temporary requirement for health certificate be placed on the agenda for the February meeting. Okay. Second. All right, we have a roll call vote on that, please. Pam Perez, aye. George Archuleta, aye. Virginia Houston, aye. Daniel Spence, aye. Rodney Walton, aye. Dr. Sheila Williams, aye. It carries. Okay. And can you offer a uh, motion for the other items that we do need to take action on, please? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I move that we um, approve uh, FBT 04, FBT 05, um, PC 01. Oh, I'm sorry, take that one off. And PC 02. Okay, can we have a second on that? Second. Right, Chair Warden, hold vote, vote, please. Are we going to remove? All of PC01. We're just going to remove PC01. That's going to go on on the table for review, and we're going to take action on it next time. Okay. The motion is to take action on the school fundraisers, the web page development, and the budget amendments at this time. So we're ready for a vote on those items. Okay. All right. Pam Perez. Hi. George Archuleta. Aye. Virginia Houston. Aye. Daniel Spence. Aye. Rodney Walton. Aye. Dr. Sheila Williams. Aye. Thank you. It carries. Okay. Thank you. And now we're going to turn to Ms. Haynes, who is going to introduce Ms. Winborn. Chair Warden, Vice Chair Perez, Superintendent Edmonds, and Board Members, good evening. A chair warden tonight we have with us Ms. Donna Winborn to present and take questions regarding the 2020 audit and um, with us virtually that is and Ms. Winborn we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. I am here to present the financial report for the Board of Education for the year ended June 30th, 2020. The financial statements are management's responsibility. My responsibility is to express an opinion on them based on our audit, and we have done so. We issued an unmodified opinion. That's the highest level that you can receive, and it means that the statements are fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, if you will, turn to page 12 in your bound audit document, and that is Exhibit 3. It is the balance sheet for your governmental funds. And the very first column is your local fund. It says general 
And the third number up from the bottom is your unassigned or um, unreserved fund balance at June 30th. And that number is $4,080,301. Then if you'll turn the page one more time to exhibit four, this is your statement of revenues, expenditures, and changes in fund balances um, for the governmental funds also. And again, that general fund column, the very first one, if you look down towards the bottom, the third number up from the bottom shows the increase or the change for the year. Um, and that is $1,156,760. Go to page 19, and this is our food service and child care. And it's the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in fund net position for the year. And one more time, the third number up from the bottom shows the change for the year. And for the school food service, we had an increase of $156,385. That is after the transfer from other funds of 128743 where, you know, most of that is usually our child, our uh, director salary. Um, but this year there's actually includes 78,000 of COVID funding um, that came over into child nutrition. For child care, there was an increase of $6,005 for the year. We did issue a management letter this year, and you have two letters with you tonight. Um, I always want to explain what they are. The one that does not have a lot of bold um, headers to it is your governance letter. And that is a boilerplate letter where if I had some things that I needed to communicate in writing to the board, I would do that in this letter. Um, you do not have anything unique um, for your board or for this audit in this letter. Um, and so that's just a standard communication that we need to, um, to give you every year. Um, you do have a second letter, um, and that's the management letter. And there's just a few things in there. I'm not going to read them in detail um, because I think you've probably already had a chance to do that. But there's a few bullet points um, just to make note of. One of those is um, at the high schools. Um, the bank deposits, um, the bank deposits are going in timely, but the, the money coming into the bookkeepers um, isn't coming in as timely as it needs to. And so we've just given you some information there so you can see the context of it. Within the state public school fund compliance testing, we did have some W4s and NC4s where we match them up to what we see in the system. And there was only maybe two, I think I've got here that had an issue, and I believe those have already been corrected. Um, on the second page of that letter, you'll see that we had three schools where we had some concussion form testing um, compliance um, issues to note, and so you can see that there. There was one finding this year, and it related to NC Pre-K where we had um, several students who did not have a developmental screening that was supposed to be on file. And it was related to satellite sites, not your internal sites. Um, and so that finding, you'll find that in the very back of your document, um, right after some reports. Um, let's see, it's on page A8. And again, I'm not going to read all of the detail of the finding, but um, it just says that we noted that there were several students enrolled in pre-K um, who did not have the developmental screening on file. And so then um, the recommendation was, of course, that um, the independent sites are reviewed by the administrator and the board um, and then the management's corrective action plan is on the very next page. And you'll find that. Does anyone have any questions on the audit? Okay. 
Are there any questions from the floor? Thank you, Ms. Winborn. Thank you. I would like to thank uh, Rachel, Meredith, and the staff um, for all the help that they gave us, including the bookkeepers at all the schools. Um, I know I say it every year, but it is a lot of information to pull together, and um, we just appreciate um, all of their help. So thank you. Um, Chair Warren, if there are no further questions, we'd like to request that the board accept the audit report as presented. So I'd like to make a motion that we accept the audit audit report as presented by Ms. Winborn and Ms. Haynes. Uh, may I have a second on that? Second. Okay. Take a roll call vote. Pam Perez. Aye. George Archuleta. Aye. Virginia Houston. Aye. Daniel Spence. Aye. Rodney Walton. Aye. Dr. Sheila Williams. Aye. Thank you. It carries. And again, I want to thank Ms. Haynes and her staff for the work that you are doing for us in the financial office. And Ms. Winborn, thank you very much for your staff's work as well. We appreciate it. Chair Warden, I just had one follow up um, okay. from, the, from committee meetings, um, and it was in regards to the pre K bonuses. So, the North, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services Division of Child Development and Early Education did award bonuses to child care teachers and staff for November and December 2020. Um, the payments were for all pre K teachers and staff in licensed child care facilities, which of course included our pre K center, um, for those serving children in a face to face environment. So our pre-K director, Jennifer Lee, did complete the process of registering and submitting attendance within the short turnaround time that they provided. We did receive those funds um, December 31st and bonuses were paid on the January 22nd pay date. Okay. So are there Good any for those questions? <laughs> <laughs> Do you mind me asking how much it was? Um, it's for face to face and it's a prorated share, but the maximum amount for November was 450 and for December was $600. Okay. All right. Thank you. If there are no further questions for me, Chair Warden, that concludes my report. Thank you very much. All right, we're going to move on to a report on the strategic plan update from uh, Ms. James Davis and Mr. Martin who is our education consultant that we have been working with in this process. Yes, yeah, so Chair Warden, Vice Chair Perez, um, tonight we have Mr. and board members, sorry, Dr. Evans. Tonight we have Mr. Um, Michael Martin um, with us as well as I think Ms. Um, Allison Redden may be on as well to give an update of our um, strategic planning process and where we are with that. So Mr. Martin and Ms. Redden. Thanks so much, Ms. James Davis. I appreciate it. Um, good evening. Um, thank you so much um, for um, giving us this opportunity to kind of um, bring to the board um, some sort of big ideas from our strategic planning process. Just as a reminder, um, this process started um, kind of this spring um, and obviously an uh, awful lot of um, kind of events happened in the world, and so we've sort of been shepherding this process um, while also the events of COVID-19 have sort of disrupted school. Um, and so it's been a real, it's been a real, I think, pleasure to sort of work through this process, um, thinking about the future. Um, and I think uh, what I'm going to do um, this evening is sort of present for discussion and feedback um, kind of the big overview of some of the things that we have seen coming out of the strategic planning process. Um, you will see that, you know, COVID-19 definitely affects how this plan um, is beginning to come together. Um, but, but it's really presented for discussion um, and input um, from you all. Just as a reminder in terms of process, um, we've you know, held focus groups throughout the fall. 
um, and then have had a development team kind of meeting regularly to steer the process. And then, of course, given the pandemic, we've moved our feedback um, to online feedback, and we've had really great response. We sort of I delayed it a little bit in the in the sort of fall just because there was just so much else happening with the pandemic. Um, and I think we were rewarded by getting sort of a really great response rate, um, over a thousand folks responding um, across the community, which is really powerful. Um, and so we feel like it's a good opportunity to present um, some big ideas um, to the board um, for discussion and feedback. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, Can you all see my screen? We do, Mr. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just talk through um, some of the big ideas um, that that we're um, hearing. And one of the things that you know we try to do is just for for board feedback is try to get the big ideas down on one page um, because it's really um, you know, the board really, your sort of sign off and, and uh, um, commitment to these ideas is the big ideas is really important to set direction. Um, and so I'm just going to talk, talk through the kind of big ideas. If you'll um, bear with me for about 10 minutes, and then I'd love to, to hear sort of thoughts and feedback, um, things that you think are missing or need to be emphasized. But again, this is the work of many, many folks um, in the community and, and lots of feedback. Um, so the way we wanted to think about um, a strategic planning outline was to really think in sort of big kind of big ideas. So I'm going to present kind of three really big ideas and then a small set of sub actions or priorities beneath them. So the first um, kind of area of concentration is really is students and ensuring that students need, gain the knowledge, skills, and mindsets to thrive. And so we've really thought about that in kind of two buckets, one being excellent academics. So this came out definitely in the survey, just the desire to ensure um, that students are, are learning at high levels and prepared for the next step. Um, so excellence in academic, but then academics, but then I think there's also a component of ensuring that we're attending to the whole child, that is, you know, the social and emotional needs, um, and sort of thinking of the child in a, in a kind of well-rounded way. Um, so with academics, um, some of the big themes that came out, um, one priority was just ensuring an early start um, and you know, ensuring that we're using evidence-based literacy instruction. And this one, I think, is really one where the, the research is very compelling. Um, one of the things that in talking with um, the board chair and with Superintendent Edmonds is really thinking about making sure that we're aligning what we do um, with what the state does. This is clearly a big priority for the state. The second um, idea that came out, and I think this came out across all sorts of feedback, was just the idea that we have opportunities for kids, rich opportunities, um, in terms of courses that are offered and that we sort of reflect students' diversity and, and offer them courses that engage their mind, both kind of in terms of workforce development um, within the community, but also student interest. Um, the third one, I think, is a, a theme that came out, and this one, I think, is very much related to um, kind of conversations about COVID-19, but the idea that um, virtual learning will be part of, you know, our future in some capacity. I think the pandemic has really um, not just in Elizabeth City, but, you know, in, in the state and in the country has brought home deeply the value of face-to-face -face instruction, but it's also, you know, gotten us much better at things like this, right? Conducting board meetings virtually and conducting class virtually, um, using electronic and te technological tools in the classroom. So I think that that is um, uh, an option that I think is sort of that feedback tells us is important to continue. I, I say that as well as saying that, you know, there's also really a need for face-to-face -face instruction. Um, that came out as well. Um, number four 
we're calling this individualized needs, but a lot of feedback, especially parent feedback um, and open-ended responses really talked about the need to make sure that we can um, meet the needs of all kids. Um, one of the kind of themes that, that we saw a lot in the open-ended conversation was um, tutoring. Um, and so the, the larger idea that kids have personalized and differentiated support, um, I think there's a sort of developing body of evidence that through the pandemic, those needs are going to be greater, um, both academic needs and social emotional needs. Um, and the last part of this is just ensuring that we have um, the right technology enabled learning at home and in school, um, and that all teachers have the tools necessary to learn um, and to teach. The whole child part of this equation for our students is really, I think, first and foremost about social, emotional, and physical health, and ensuring that um, all students have access to caring relationships with adults, and um, you know, just even physical activity, um, nutritious meals, overall safety, just that being a very important priority. The, the, the seventh one there, I think, is really about um, ensuring that kids are ready for life. Um, and so taking the lens of, you know, are we building practical, meaningful skills and employability skills for productive citizenship? Um, the eighth one is about collaboration and nurturing students' ability to work with people from different backgrounds um, to achieve things and solve problems. And lastly, and this one I think is slightly different than number two, um, but just the extracurricular. So in our conversations, and I think, you know, obviously through the pandemic, um, I think students and parents and teachers have felt the sort of pain of this of just not having the same sort of level of kind of clubs and PE and sports, the arts and advanced programs, just the idea that, um, you know, that is very much part of what makes school uh, a kind of community. And so those are some of the big themes that came away in terms of students. Um, the second big category is really about educators and um, ensuring, I think, that educators are esteemed and supported. So I think in, in many of our, our conversations and in our um, feedback, we sort of saw that there's no way we can get to where we want to get to with students without our educators. Um, and so some, some big sort of priorities that came out of that um, are just recruitment, selection, and hiring. Um, so proactively recruiting a diverse staff um, both through institutes of higher education and that kind of relationship, um, but also thinking very strategically about internal advancement strategies, um, you know, moving folks into classroom positions within the community, um, and then just, you know, making as efficient as possible the hiring practices, um, just thinking about, you know, competition within in the, the larger community and ensuring that we are able to recruit, select, and hire the best teachers. Um, secondly, I think just the idea of pathways, I mean, we, we've thought a lot about, you know, and talked a lot about how, where teachers are sort of, how teachers see opportunity in their jobs. And I think um, there could be pathways into new kind of roles. There's been a lot of work throughout the state um, in thinking about teacher leadership roles, but elevating teachers through that, that's sort of connected to the, the third big idea. Um, and I think this is, I think this is one I'm interested to sort of think about together, but just ensuring that, you know, employees are esteemed and, and we, that, you know, articulate the vital role that teachers play. And I, I've heard that from um, the leadership at Elizabeth City. I've heard it from the board. I think just the idea that we really elevate educators and all staff. And that we recognize, too, I think, that adults have social emotional needs. Um, and that is also ever so true during the pandemic. The fourth one, and you'll just forgive me, I'm moving quickly because I, I do want to make sure that I offer ample time for discussion, um, is just the idea of, of collaborative leadership. So I think, you know, just the even the process of kind of continually reaching out to staff um, and to the community 
uh, to engage in conversations and collective decision making at the district level, that is clearly something that people um, are interested in in furthering. And then the last two are really kind of learning opportunities. Um, one of the things we heard was just sort of choice based learning pro professional development opportunities um, to make sure that students can meet the needs of students uh, or teachers can meet the needs of students and that school leaders are, you know, so pivotal um, in a district and again, esteeming them and giving them opportunities to develop and grow and, and be supported. And the final category, so we have sort of our students and our educators and the final sort of set of priorities is, and you know, I think we heard this really strongly and I think the, even the board sort of, a, a sort of charged to build a community-based strategic planning is a great um, testament to this, but just the idea that the, that we value and engage our community. Um, so the first, I think, item, one of the things that, that we heard a lot is just that, you know, um, the superintendent's report talked about, you know, the number of kids that are back to face to face. And, you know, at some point, that's going to be a, that the community around schools um, will be sort of back, you know, in the way that it once was before that we'll have the option of face-to-face -face schooling for all the kids that are um, in that district. And we think that's a very important opportunity um, to leverage that um, school community and really think about building back some of the relationships and the trust, um, the things that are that are built naturally when you're in the hallway with with students and with your fellow teachers. But we really think there's an opportunity to kind of reconnect um, and leverage face-to-face -face in a new way. Obviously, communication, um, just building dialogue across the community, connecting with faith community, business, civic organizations, and, and other partners. And we definitely heard from those communities in our um, online questionnaire um, and just creating like a really open and inviting environment for parents. Number three, I think, relates to um, the presentation that came right before mine, but just ensuring fiscal stewardship, um, both, you know, operational sustainability, but then, you know, I think as, as the General Assembly is coming back together and state budgets are built for the next two years, um, I think maybe more than ever aligning resources to the practices most likely to um, improve student outcomes is really a uh, really important part of this. Um, and then lastly, just holistic services and partnerships. So, so really emphasizing that um, the school system lives in a larger community um, and we can strengthen collaboration and partnership with social services, faith organizations, and other community organizations to just establish those really powerful partnerships. And the last one I think is, is, is forward thinking. And I think this came out of, you know, a really fruitful conversation that we had with the development team, um, really thinking about kind of the impact of COVID-19 um, and, and thinking about, you know, and I think the feedback has told us there will be a demand for more virtual offerings, possibly, you know, all virtual offerings. And we feel like um, and, and heard from the community that for as much as like there's pain points around virtual instruction, there's also a real opportunity um, to incorporate some of those practices that we've learned and some of the ability to kind of um, keep learning going that in time, you know, when it's not in the actual school day, that those things are really valuable. Um, and so it could be a good opportunity to build on the things we've learned. Um, I think in the hopes that, you know, for as hard as this pandemic has been in your community and every other community, that there's a future where some of the things we have learned have helped help us address some of the challenges that have always been in place. Um, and I'll just close out and would be happy to, you know, take thoughts and questions with, with just some of the big ideas uh, in terms of core values, one of the exercises that we did with the development team was to try to settle on a short list of core values um, that can
can drive staff decisions, can drive, um, you know, student thinking. Um, and the, the ones that we came away with through sort of a collaborative process was integrity, respect, and equity. Um, and the idea that we have uh, a, a really bright future, a lot of work to do, obviously, given the, the pandemic. Um, but that sort of um, encapsulates the big ideas that have come out of this feedback process. Again, I would just say that I, you know, really appreciate that this process, that we kept this process running parallel while addressing so many other things. And of course, um, I work with Superintendent and Ms. James Davis to make sure that we, you know, did this on a, on a modified timeline. But, um, but I think the results are really hopeful. Um, and so with that, I have actually just a few more kind of next steps, but I think it maybe makes sense to just stop, um, get thoughts and feedback, um, areas we want to emphasize, um, and other things from the board before I kind of close out with next steps. Thank you, Claudia, for questions. If the board has any questions, what's the best support? Before we have any second piece, the board had any questions. Yes, before um, Mr. Martin Lee, the um, board members, if you have any questions um, for Mr. Martin or me. Oh, it doesn't appear that we have any questions right now, Mr. Martin. Thank you for that update. Thank you. Should be next step. Next step. Oh, and you're going to do some next steps now, right? Yeah, yeah. Just very briefly. I think one of the things that we we'll just wanted to walk through very briefly, and I'll, I'll close out. Um, so, love any feedback that you have, and just sort of think of this document as a living document. I think given all the work uh, that's been done with COVID-19, we do expect that, you know, the document will, will change. Um, uh, we will develop sort of metric trackers. This is a really important part of this, as, you know, as you look at students and educators and communities, what does it mean to engage our community? How do we measure that? How do you as a board um, hold the leadership uh, accountable um, for, for any of those measures? Um, obviously, there's budget conversations that, that need to be had as those are upcoming. Um, and then we'll work on internal timelines and operational plans, obviously a communication strategy, um, and then we'll return to the board um, for approval um, of the strategic plan. So those are, those are just kind of a short list of next steps, but I appreciate everyone's time this evening. So any any questions about the the next steps? All right. So thank you, Mr. Martin, again for um, that update and those um, including the final steps. Thank you. Ms. Perez, you want to move on to personalized education? Sure. Well, we have curriculum and instruction update from Dr. Amy Spencer. Good evening, Board Chair Warden, Vice Chair, and Committee Chair. Perez, Dr. Edmonds board members. This evening, I am presenting curriculum and instruction updates by school as requested in the January 19th Board of Education Committee meetings. This evening's update will first review iReady beginning of the year data by elementary school. Second, review the iReady beginning of the year and middle of the year data by each middle school, while additionally looking at those students who were all remote and those who began all remote and then returned face to face. Finally, we will look at the elementary jumpstart data by school. The first set of data we are going to look at is the iReady at the elementary level. This first table you see is the elementary school benchmark data from the beginning of the year. At the top of the slide is the key for looking at the tiers. 
all beginning of the year benchmarks for students in grades K-8 were given at home. Just a reminder that the elementary students are currently in the testing window for the middle of the year assessments. Consequently, this update will not have a comparative analysis for the beginning of the year to the middle of the year for iReady at the elementary level. This first slide shows the beginning of the year tiers for Central Elementary School by grade level. Remember that tier one is green, means at grade level. Tier two is yellow, which means below grade level. And tier three is red, which is well below grade level. Out of 301 students at Central Elementary, 271 completed the beginning of the year assessment. This is the data from J.C. Sawyer Elementary School. Out of 345 students, 317 completed the beginning of the year assessment. And again, you can see that kindergarten is at the top and then fifth grade is at the bottom. This is the data from Northside Elementary School. Out of 438 students, 418 completed the beginning of the year assessment. Pasquatank Elementary School has 267 students, 246 completed the beginning of the year assessment. P.W. Moore has 368 students, 316 completed the beginning of the year assessment. Sheep Harney has 329 students, 287 completed the beginning of the year assessment. And finally, Weeksville Elementary. That would not be my battery. It's not me. It's Amber. It's Amber. Does she need to know? Does she need a cord? Okay. She need a. So what I can tell you from Weeksville Elementary School <laughs> is that there were 212 students in the school, and 200 completed the beginning of the year assessment. So all of these charts that you've shown us is beginning of year. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the be the beginning of the year assessments began. Um, I have the date because I do not want to misspeak. They started on August seventeenth and mm -hmm. they ended in, um, September twenty fifth. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions from from this portion? Of your slides. I do need the rest of my slides, and those are the ones that um, I believe were specifically asked about the remote and face-to-face, -face, which is um, I would like to share. Okay. That's fine. Dr. Spencer, you said that um, the middle grades, the middle testing is just taking place now? The middle of the year testing for the um, elementary, the state set that um, that window. And so their assessments were from January 6th to the 29th. Um, the middle of the year benchmarks for middle school, they gave theirs um, December 1st through the 18th. So we do have their data. We just did not have um, the elementary, and that's because it was set by the state. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. When when will you have that, that data? I mean, as soon as the... the Testing is once we've completed. completed the testing. Yes, then we would be able to um, go back to segregate. So the we data. could do a comparison mm -hmm. from beginning to mm -hmm. okay. the middle. It was just um, until that window is closed. Um, we still have students that are testing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And we're on slide 11. Okay. 
So the next two slides will illustrate the beginning of the year and middle of the year iReady data by school and subject from the students who were all remote. So if you look at the chart, this is the slide that shows the ELA data. There are 766 students combined in um, remote status, 380 at ECMS, 386 at River Road. And so if you look, tier one is grade level, tier two is well below, or tier, tier two, excuse me, is below, and then tier three is well below. And then this slide shows the math data for the students who were all remote. And again, for ECMS and River Road. The next two slides show beginning of the year and middle of the year iReady data by school and subject from the students who started the year remote and then returned face to face. So remember, everyone was remote the first nine weeks. And then we had some of the students that returned face to face. So this first slide shows the ELA data. There were 447 total students that were face to face, 234 at ECMS and 213 for let's River make, Road. Let's make sure the board is following this mm -hmm. because I just caught it on like this slide. Is that so when you look at tier one for beginning of the year, it's 46. Yes, ma'am. And for then face to face is 39. Correct. So those are the same students that were. Yes. Um, that were remote at the beginning of the year and then they were face to face for the middle of the year. Okay. Mm -hmm. so just want to make sure the board is following that. Yes. Yep. And then this data would be the beginning of the year and middle of the year for math. Okay. The elementary jump start program was held in July. So that will be the next slide. Students were identified to participate in the program based off of iStation data. Since elementary did not have middle of the year benchmark data, the data you are looking at are grades from Q1 to Q2. So we shared that at the committee meetings, but we have broken it down by schools for tonight's meeting. Mm -hmm. Remember, the students who attended the remote elementary jumpstart were considered below grade level in reading as identified by the state benchmark assessments. This slide is showing, in particular, the students by school who participated in the jumpstart program who are currently in third grade. So they had just completed second grade, went to jumpstart, and then are now in third grade. And these are their grades for Q1 and Q2. The next slide shows the student data by school for the students who participated in the Jump Start who are currently in fourth grade and were in third grade last year. So they ended third grade, did the summer Jump Start, and are now in fourth grade. Ms. Boyer, can you move your cursor so that that black line so we can see the last line of data? Mm -hmm. and that's just the total. There you go. Are there any questions? Are there any questions for Dr. Spencer? Can she share that slide with us? The presentation? Mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah. that would be helpful. It was it was fast. So it's yeah, a lot, it it's fast, a lot of it. Well, it's a lot of information. Yeah. Okay. Yes. If we could get absolutely, it. I can change. do what you. Okay. Let's send it by email. Mm -hmm. I can send it Without by email. One? Absolutely. Okay. Thank yeah. You. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Have you got any conclusions about? I can say that I was surprised by some of the data because I thought that um, some of the students that were remote that would come back um, 
that they would do better face to face, but that indeed um, wasn't the case for all students, um, which goes to, um, we could suggest that, um, and it goes along with what others have said, that some students are doing better remotely. Um, I think we dismiss that sometimes because we, we think that everybody does face to face and um, I think thinking is good, but I think when we have data and this data shows the context of our, our students. And so all students are different. Um, this is a very tedious process, um, but it was worth it because when you start to really look through each individual student, each individual student is different. And so we need to, when we talk about personalized education and when we talk about what we are doing for our students, we need to really make sure that we're looking at each individual student and what's best for them. And I know they're doing that at the school level, the principals are doing that and the teachers are doing that. Um, but overall, that, that was an mm -hmm. aha to me. And the number of students that um, there were no assessments for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we're going to move on to global citizens. If there are no more questions for Dr. Spencer and Mr. Archuleta. Uh, yes, we're going to look at the uh, middle school again, and I believe we had asked for certain numbers, and Dr. Edmonds is going to present that. Board Warden, Vice Chair Perreza, Committee Chair Archuleta, and Board Members. Um, the principals at the middle school did um, go back and survey families again. And the chart that you're going to see up here, I will, I don't know if you can see it, so I'll read through it. Um, so from the last time that we reported on January 19th to today, um, Elizabeth City Middle School had one additional student that um, showed interest in football. And so they still have the same number that are eligible, which is 11. For soccer, um, the number stayed the same, 22 interested in 20 that were eligible. For volleyball for Elizabeth City Middle School, we had two additional students that showed interest and two additional students that are eligible. So that took them from 10 students to 12 that are eligible for volleyball at ECMS. And for cheer, they had one additional student to show interest and that student was eligible. So they've increased from nine students that are eligible for cheer to 10. For River Road Middle School, for football, they had 13 additional students to show interest and they have eight additional students that are eligible. So they've gone from seven students that were eligible for football to 15. For soccer, they had um, eight additional students to um, show interest. So they've gone, they went from 10 students that showed interest to 18. And they've gone from five students that were eligible at the last meeting to 11 that are eligible now, which is six additional students. And of those, Three, they have three girls, so they have to have four girls to play on the team, and they have three of the four that they need. For volleyball, um, last time they had 10 students that showed interest. This time it has increased to 19, so nine additional students. And so it went from having nine students eligible to 17 that are eligible. I think that's a 17. Is that a 17, Ms. Oria? Yeah. Okay. And then for cheer, for River Road Middle School, they had um, 16 students that showed interest at the last meeting. And since that time, they reached out and they now have 22 students that were interested and went from eight that were eligible to now they have 11 students that are eligible for cheer. And those were the data points that the um, board asked us to go back and have the principals survey the students again to see if they would have additional students that were interested. Okay, I think uh, we've already discussed this. We've already, you know, made comments on it. So I'm gonna go ahead and make a motion that we go ahead and do something on middle school athletics. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, 
So okay, what was the motion? Yeah, I'll explain the motion. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's been a motion else. made and a second. I think he's asking to clarify your motion. I'm sorry. What's that? I was saying, what was the motion you just made? The motion is that we go ahead and take action on middle school athletics. Where we are you going? So I made that you second, right? That we go ahead and take action, yes. And so um, do we need a motion in favor? What, uh, is it correctly defined what the action is? That's that's my question. I'm like, should we decide? So we what kind of what are we going to do in middle school athletics? Well, correct? the motion should be that we are going to approve right. uh, middle school athletics. Okay. So. Yeah, we're going to make making a motion that will approve middle school athletics. Okay. okay, second. And it's been seconded. Okay. So we'll take a vote by Pam Pereza. Yes. George Archuleta. Yes. Virginia Houston. No. Daniel Spence. Yes. Rodney Walton. Yes. Dr. Sheila Williams. Yes. The motion carries, Ms. Gordon. Okay. So we'll go forward with uh, middle school sports in the spring. All right. All right. Now we're going to move on to excellent educators. And are you ready, Dr. Williams? I am. I am. So we have a few items that uh, Rhonda James Davis has presented to us. Um, as well as uh, Kelly Powell had presented. Um, Ms. Davis, did you have any additional information to share? Yes, um, Ms. Powell was going to She, okay. Okay. All right, so is she going to share now? Is she virtual? Yeah. She's virtual. Hello, Chair Warren, Vice Chair Perez, Board Members, and Superintendent Dr. Edmonds. I am before you to ask for approval of the beginning teacher support plan. An update was added to our local plan per recent guidance from the regional facilitator. Section C and Section D from the original plan presented in December have been combined into Section C. Also, there was an addition to Section G of the plan in reference to the time period Beginning teachers in year one and two must be observed, and that's within the first semester. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Powell. Are there any questions or discussion about this item? All we have, Ms. Powell. Okay, thank you, Ms. Cowell. Thank you. Did a good job, Ms. Cowell. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we will move on then um, for excellent educators. That is an action item, so we will need to vote on what was uh, presented to us in closed session. Can I get a motion for that? I make a motion that we approve the items that were presented in closed session. Okay. Second. Second. Thank you. Call Pam Perez. Yes. George Archuleta. Yes. Virginia Houston. Yes. Daniel Spence. Yes. Rodney Walton. Yes. Dr. Sheila Williams. Yes. The motion carries. Okay. And next, um, beginning a teacher plan that was revised, uh, just presented to us by Ms. Cowell. Uh, we need a motion on that, please. I make a motion that we approve the um, revised plan as presented by Ms. Kelly Cowell. Second. Thank you. Pam Pereza. Yes. George Archuleta. Yes. Virginia Houston. Yes. Daniel Spence. Yes. Rodney Walton. Yes. Dr. Sheila Williams. Yes. The motion carries. Okay, thank you, Pam. Is there any other business to come before the board tonight? Anything anyone needs to discuss or would like to share at this particular time? 
I do want to say that the retirement events were very nice, even though they're drive through. Um, I think they were uh, very well attended. Um, everybody did a superior job. Um, we had great music. Mr. Cunningham showed off his DJ skills. Um, but uh, those those events are always very special, even if we had to do them the way that we we had to do them. Okay. Also, I want to compliment the uh, health department as well as our school uh, officials who had a primary role in setting up the vaccine clinics. They were very organized, very well uh, run. There was no issue at all. Um, I just, I appreciate it so much. Um, and I want to remind each and every one in here, we have a tremendous community here in Elizabeth City. And uh, just want to share my appreciation for that community and everything that everyone is doing to make us better and stronger. So with that said, I'd like a motion to adjourn at this time. May I just address one more issue, please? And Dr. Edmonds, I'd, I'd like to um, again say how much we appreciated your tenure here with uh, Elizabeth City Pastor Tate Schools. I think we made a number of strides. Um, and I would say other things, but I won't. But thank you very much for your service. And we wish you well on your next adventure. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. So may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second? Second. Roll call, Ms. Sawyer. Mm -hmm. Pam Perezza. Yes. George Archuleta. Yes. Virginia Houston. Yes. Daniel Spence. Yes. Rodney Walton. Yes. Dr. Sheila Williams. Yes. Motion carries. Thanks. Thank you.